You're listening to Talking to Teens, where we speak with leading experts from a variety of disciplines about the art and science of parenting teenagers. I'm your host, Andy Earle. We're here today with Tony Wagner talking about his new book, Learning by Heart, An Unconventional Education. Tony is the best-selling author of seven other books already, including Creating Innovators, The Global Achievement Gap, and Most Likely to Succeed. He's a senior research fellow at the Learning Policy Institute. Before that, he had a ton of different positions at Harvard University over the course of more than 20 years. He also spent time as a high school teacher, K-8 through principal, and university professor in teacher education. We are so excited to speak with Tony today. Today about education, about learning, about how to help lost and resistant teenagers find topics they're interested in and want to learn about, and ideas from his newest book, Learning by Heart. Tony, thank you so much for making the time to come on the show today. You have written a lot of books at this point. How many of them? Seven published, two not published. <laughs> okay. And so now it's time for a memoir. But it's also really about learning and about education. Absolutely. So what kind of inspired this book at this time? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, you know, I'd written six kind of argument-based books. I felt I really had no new arguments to make. <laughs> but I had stories to tell. Sure. I mean, people don't know very much about me, not because I don't talk a lot about my past, but in fact, uh, as you read, I was a, a one-time high school dropout, a two-time college dropout, uh, caught up very much in the civil rights and anti-war movement of the 60s. And th that combination of things, wanting to be the teacher I never had and wanting to give back, were the reasons I became a teacher. And so a good chunk of the book is about my early learning experiences, my struggles with school. I had no particular learning disability. I just hated school. I was bored. <laughs> and so uh, it's also about the people who influenced my learning for better or for worse in some cases. Sure. And then how I tried to translate all of those things into my first decade of teaching English as a high school teacher. First in a school for risk kids, public school, and then in a private school. I was Sidwell Friends where uh, Obama's kids went. So it, it's a kind of, it's a learning journey, really, uh, trying to discover who I am as a learner, uh, where and when and how I thrive, and then really trying to translate that set of experiences into how, how do I really help each student develop their unique capabilities. And what did you discover about yourself? Well, I'm restless, I'm impatient. I have a, you know, I'm driven by a strong sense of curiosity and a desire to, to understand, to make meaning and to create. And school provided none of those opportunities <laughs> to explore my creativity. No, no, then we don't have time for that. Yeah. Explore my curiosity. Nope, sorry, not, not really. Only in these boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And to make meaning of the world around me it was the beginning of the 60s. It was a crazy time. And there was, there was nothing in school that helped me make sense of that world. So to people who are feeling that way in the education system, what do they need to kind of find something or uh, get on a track? Well, I think they need teachers who listen to them first and foremost, and who are not so constrained by teaching subjects and subject content that they forget they're teaching young people. Yeah. And so I think that's one point. And something I sort of talk about towards the end is that that requires teachers to really distill what's critically important in their sort of content or in their teaching and, and not kind of fill the airwaves with things that kids, you know, hear and forget. Yeah. And I don't think teachers can do this alone. I think mean, teachers have to work together and say, what are the most important things kids need to learn that, that are foundational? And how do we then free up more time 
for kids to explore their own interests, to apply their learning, and to create. So for you, was that kind of when you started working privately with one teacher and really working on your writing? And that was kind of an experience that helped you just start to sort of see something that you thrived at or something? Yeah. Well, I first began with, with a, my ninth grade teacher who gave me one of the very few creative writing assignments I had throughout my entire ah, career. And, okay. you know, I wrote about this... Uh, guide in new hampshire i'd gone to summer camp and great fun doing it and it was the first and i think the only a i got in my entire <laughs> high school experience so uh, and then in my senior year i mean you could look at my senior year as a tale of two english teachers it was the best of times it was the worst of times the worst of times started first uh an english teacher who just verbally abused me to a very extreme degree uh and uh, no need to go into the details now. You can read it for yourselves. But I just was horrified. I felt like he was sentencing me to a life of being a failure. Only he used the F word. And then, you know, I was in this very last chance school for kids like me who had been kicked out or thrown uh, or dropped out. And again, still as a senior. And I knew I wanted to write. I'd, had, I'd been writing since I was 14 on my own. And so I sought out another English teacher, not my senior English teacher, he was hopeless, but another <laughs> English teacher who, you know, and I went to him and I said, will you teach me to write? And he said, quote, I'd be delighted. He was an Englishman, very lovely, <laughs> warm. Um, and so we met weekly. This was not for credit, um, yeah. you know, but I put more time and effort into that class than I had ever put into any other <laughs> class in four years of high school. 12 yeah. years of school for that. And he gave me a different kind of genre or type of writing to try every single week. And then, we, and then we would meet and he would look for something that was a strength in it. Uh, and sometimes it might have been a bit of a stretch, but he'd always try to find something that was, you know, he could justifiably praise me for. And then he'd make a couple of suggestions, not a lot. Uh, and to me, that became a model of how I taught writing for 10 years as a high school teacher. But more than that, it really um, gave me a sense of the power of what a teacher can do if he understands a, a student in front of him. He, he treats that student as an individual and listens to that student. So it was a remarkable experience. And of course, I had many other out-of-school teachers who were also wonderful, whom I profile in the book. AP exams start May 11th. Are you or your teen anxious? Prompt is here to help for the English and History APs. These exams have a single essay written in 45 minutes. Prompt is the world leader in writing coaching. Their writing feedback is what great teachers provide when they have more time. Here's how it works. You or your teen write practice exam essays. Then, submit them to Prompt's writing coaches, and you'll receive feedback consistent with AP rubrics within 48 hours. Get started now. Sign up at prompt.com slash AP and use the code TEENS to get $10 off. Once again, that's prompt.com slash AP. Use the code TEENS at checkout. Be confident for your AP exams. You have a story in here about someone called the mole. Oh, that's the one who used the F word to uh, yeah, 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 yeah. define me as a human being. Yeah. And that was something I marked in here that was impactful for me was this story where he kind of busts you. I was in a second rate boarding school for boys. And there's nothing worse than a boys' boarding school. Maybe maybe they're better today, but you know I believe in single sex education, but only for girls. <laughs> you know I think single sex schools for girls are great. Single sex schools for boys are a, you know an invitation to say this. Uh, yeah. And so this particular teacher taught by fear, 
and uh, every every kid in the school was afraid of him. And, uh, he he was he would lecture all fifty of us who were twelfth graders in one class, and wow. he was, you know, pretending to be a college professor, if you will. And you know, if he caught you not paying attention to something, he'd hurl a blackboard eraser or a piece of chalk or even a book at you. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So one night, um, you know, we, we had permission to go off campus Saturday night. So I went off and came back about 15 minutes late past curfew. And sure enough, it was this English teacher whom we nicknamed the mole because he was short and kind of like, you know, like he kind of wore, went around looking for trouble with his huge 4D <laughs> cell mag light. And so yeah. sure enough, it was the mole on duty. And he sees me, and I thought, you know, worst case is, you know, maybe I'll get a little detention or something. Not a big yeah, guy. yeah, right. People are late. That that's not. It's fifteen funny. minutes. And so he shines this huge flashlight <laughs> in my face, and I don't, I don't know whether this is PG thirteen or R rated, but he said, "Wagner, you're an f up. You've always been an f up. You're always gonna be an f up." This was 1963. I'd never heard an adult use the F word, let alone an F word on me. So uh, I promptly left that school early the next morning, never to return. Wow. And that's profound, I think, but we do that a lot, I think, by kind of labeling kids. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, first of all, the nature of schooling is that really by the age of 15 or 16, high school kids know they're in one of two buckets. They're either winners or losers, right? Uh, Academically, socially, uh, athletically, they're winners or losers, period. And many high school kids believe that to be something that's true about them as human beings, yeah. as opposed to recognizing that school only develops a tiny fraction of the human capability, a very narrow band uh, of skills, only recognizes a tiny fraction of what is the human capability. And everything else is considered superfluous or even worse, you know, a penalty. So beyond that, I think teachers, you know, invariably look for kids who are like them or like their subject or whatever, and, and they reinforce that. And I don't want to entirely blame teachers here because, first of all, this was this early 60s. There was this macho mentality in these boarding schools. That was yeah, all. right. It was also that, you know, today, even today, public school teachers have this massive load, 150 or more kids. And, you know, you can't individualize. It's not so you can't, but it's extremely difficult to get to know your kids and to individualize instruction with this impossible load. So some of it is really structural. We assume that the purpose of education is to batch process large numbers of kids on an assembly line, right? They all get the same part at the same time. Yeah. Okay, yeah. here's your lesson on now comma. Now install this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, we're gonna be talking about uh, parts of speech today. Everybody, get out your pencil and paper because we're going to talk about gerunds. They're really fun mm -hmm. and exciting, and you got to know about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. I used to have to look it up every night before I taught it, before I realized it was a waste of time. To teach it. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, 30 years of research to show that knowledge of grammar does not improve one's writing. That what improves one's writing is writing. Doing it, writing yeah, experiencing it. Authentic audience and writing about things that interest you or that you care about. What inspired you to kind of get started with your self-study in writing was you stumbled across a book of aphorisms by Polish author Stanislaw Lech. Yeah. So what are aphorisms exactly? And what was it about these that inspired you? Well, first of all, you know, even though I hated school, I, I was a voracious reader. I consumed all the great novels of Steinbeck and Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe, and many, many others. 
And I was very careful to not read the books that were assigned, or if they were assigned, to read them <laughs> ahead of when they were assigned so the teacher wouldn't ruin it for me. Uh. <laughs> so at any rate, um, somehow I came across Stanislaw Lech, uh, Book of Aphorisms. Aphorisms are short, witty uh, statements. Uh, like if a blind man finds a four-leaf clover, is he lucky? Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, after reading a book of those, I, I decided I'd compose some of my own. Yeah. And so one that really sticks with me that I, I composed back then at the tender age of 17 is, <laughs> is life nothing more than a question and answer period where the questions go unanswered and the answers go unquestioned? Ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> that prison for the time, right? So that's cool, and that like it, um, inspired you. And I think it's so that's just so true about learning that it doesn't really happen until we find a reason to care about whatever the subject is. You know, for you, it was this book. You never know what that's going to be for someone. So I guess I don't know how you encourage that. Well, it comes back to my advice to to teachers and to young people today, which is stay curious. Just keep a little book, a little three by five pad in your pocket or something, where you write down your questions or your ideas or your concerns. Uh, you listen to yourself and to what makes you curious or concerned. And then my advice to teachers is to make time for young people periodically in their classes to pursue that question or that concern, to have time to do their own independent research projects. Uh, and then present them back to the class. And this is something every teacher can do in any class. And indeed, I know teachers who tried it. Sure, yeah. And you hear about companies doing that kind of thing where you have time to work on whatever you want. But exactly. yeah, that's such a neat idea to just like do that in your classroom. Yeah. I think it starts with curiosity. You know, I wrote a book called Creating Innovators. I did in-depth interviews with young people in their 20s, all of whom were identified as creative problem solvers. Some were in high tech. One of them was the project manager for the first iPhone. But some of them were social entrepreneurs starting uh, social enterprises, trying to solve social problems. Wide range, equal number of young men, young women, uh, some from privilege, some from poverty. But they had a few things in common. One was, they told me, they'd all become young innovators, creative problem solvers, in spite uh, of something, not because of it, right? Yeah. Mirroring my own experience. And then secondly, they were curious people. And even today, as I meet adult innovators who are sometimes in their 80s, I met a gentleman in January who has like 20 patents. He's just insatiably curious. Yeah. And so I think curiosity is the seed of learning, is the seed of intellectual growth, even emotional growth. And it, it's something that we have to pay critical attention to and nurture. What exactly is the Carnegie unit? Ha! Well, you know, way back in the late 19th century, all these high schools were being created. This is the dawn of kind of the industrial era and the dawn of the industrialization of education. And so it was the Wild West of, of schooling. And so a group of people, men, all men, got together led by Charles Eliot, who was then the president of Harvard University, they said, look, we can't have all this randomization in education. We've got to standardize. And so we're going to decide what an academic credit is. Like, you know, you, you take Latin, you get credit on your transcript. Well, what is, what is that? What does that look like? Right. The equivalent of 200 hours of seat time served in class studying this particular thing. Now, what's astounding to me is that this system has been in place for a century. You pick up any kid's high school transcript today, it is, it's got numbers, right? Four numbers for English, three for math. Those are Carnegie units. That's what they oh. are. And it's not a certificate of mastery. 
It's a certificate of seat time served. You put in this many hours <laughs> sitting yeah, there right. in the classroom. I've yeah. served my seat time, therefore I get my credit. Hand yeah. me my credit, please. I've, I've served my time, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me out of prison with my credit. I'm done. <laughs> I punched the clock from this time to this time. Exactly. Right? And so one of the core arguments I make about the, the need to reimagine education is to move it from being a certificate of seat time served and the hours you've served in different places to a certificate of mastery. Yeah. It should be like the merit badge approach in scouting. And I actually learned that, you know, in summer camp. I, I went to a summer camp here in New Hampshire that was one of the very first to use the merit badge approach to certifying kids having acquired a level of mastery. Now they uh, call them ribbons, but it's the same thing as the merit badge approach in scouting. It's a century old. And what it means is that, okay, I, I earned my ribbon in axemanship. So what I had to do to earn that ribbon was first of all, learn how to properly carry an ax. So I didn't uh, kill sure. myself, I cut my <laughs> leg off. There is a, there are, you know, good and bad ways to carry an ax. Sure, yeah. Secondly, I had to learn how to sharpen it, how to keep it sharp, because a sharper ax is far less likely to bounce back off a log and, and cut you than a dull mm. ax. So it's a safety issue. Then I had to learn how to fell a tree. Well, how, where do you where do you make your cut? Where do you make your second cut? The V's on each side, right? How do you do that? And how do you make sure the tree doesn't hang in other trees? Yeah. Then the next thing I had to do, okay, I felled a tree. Now I have to cut it into, you know, bite-sized pieces. Uh, well, how big a V do you make when you're trying to cut through a log of a certain diameter? Then I had to learn how to split. I had to learn how to split logs because these logs are too big. All with an ax. And finally, I had to cut and chop a certain amount of wood demonstrating proper technique. Then and only then did this teacher certify me for my ribbon in axemanship. Now this particular camp had ribbons like the scouts do in many, many different things. You could earn ribbons in riflery and canoeing and sailing and rowing and swimming and all kinds of things. But this was the ribbon that, for, because nobody else had it in camp, so I decided I needed it. <laughs> I'm going to be the one person. But there was also some chemistry between this older man and I. Uh, and I, uh, years later, I discovered the nature of the chemistry. I returned to the camp a couple of summers ago, just about now, to just kind of refresh my memory because I was going to write about it. Yeah. And uh, I'm talking to... Uh, the alumni person there, and, I'm, and he's asking me about memories, and I'm talking about this guy, Colonel Elwell. And he said, well, would you like to read his dissertation? I said, what? He said, yeah, just like you, he also went to the Harvard Graduate School of Education and earned his doctorate there. I was mind blown. I didn't know that. So I read his dissertation, written in 1925. And I swear, you know, he and I would have been Good buddies then and now, because he was writing about how the industrial model of education was grinding down kids and only turning out one kind of kid suitable for college and not paying any attention to the rest of the kids and how this form of education was doing this at the expense of kids being outside and learning outdoor skills. It was an incredible uh, dissertation and discovery. You know, did he somehow, when I was like 11, 12 years old, influenced me to become an educator and end up, you know, writing books with ideas that were in some ways similar to his. No way of knowing, but it's a fascinating to kind of wonder about that. And another time when having an adult teacher or mentor was really impactful. We're here with Tony Wagner talking about stories from his memoir, Learning by Heart, and about education tips for resistant and difficult teenagers. Here's a look at what's coming up in the second half of the show. But later he said, you know, teaching is the art of constructing an opportunity for a thoughtful conversation. You know, a lot of times kids don't believe you're interested. They're not going to tell you because they think you don't really want to know. 
one kid, a so-called greaser, who's hung out at the gym all day, never went to class, has said, well, I want to learn about car engines. I said, great. And so, you know, I'd suggest a couple of resources. I went to the library, helped him find the book. A week later, two weeks later, I'd meet with him. I said, well, did you, what did you learn? Yeah. Well, I didn't, read, didn't really read anything. So it, it takes persistence, tenacity, coaching. Ultimately, yeah. what he told me, and again, I had to keep listening, keep asking, persisting, taking his interest seriously. Finally, he said, you know, what I really want to know about is the difference between carburation versus fuel injection for an engine and what's best and why. And so he ended up doing a, a research paper on the, the difference yeah. and which one he would want for his car and why. But it took me a year to get to that point with that. Wow. Year. And those meetings were just kind of felt like you weren't really getting anywhere or that was like meeting and you hadn't done anything. One step forward, two steps backwards, you know, sometimes you wouldn't show up at all. You know, <laughs> it was a challenge. You thrive in education when you're allowed to do it on your own terms or pursue what interests you most. Want to hear the full interview? Sign up for a subscription today. You get unlimited access to all the interviews I've conducted. It's completely affordable, and your subscription helps support the work we do here at Talking to Teens. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.